Good morning, everybody. I've got three things I want to cover in my presentation. First of all, what is integrated digital delivery? What does it mean for the industry? What are the skills that we currently have and our current experience? And how does that play into the current industry? And most importantly, what are the challenges we're facing going forward? I think that we need to be very cognizant of one key issue, and that is we don't have enough people in our industry to deliver the projects that we want to deliver. And we've got to figure out how to attract more people into the industry and how to train more people in the industry. So that's a key message. So first of all, what is IDD? So IDD is Integrated Digital Delivery, and you can see here development from BIM through VDC into IDD. Now these slides were presented by BCA in October last year. IDD is the integration between design, manufacturing, digital construction, and asset management. And there is a big challenge in those four domains. They are four silos that don't collaborate easily or commonly. So people working in design don't necessarily have experience of doing manufacturing and precasting or prefabrication. People in construction don't have experience of managing the delivery of prefabricated uh, systems. So in order to overcome this, we need to share experience among ongoing projects. We need to share training from those projects. And I have a, a suggestion for BCA that may be worth considering. When you're looking at future provisions for contracts, put something in for training and research and development as a requirement of the contract, a provision. So every time that money is spent on a project, X has to be spent on research and development and training. We do it for safety. Why can't we do it for skills development? So when you talk about digital design, you cover things like BIM. You cover things like augmented reality, virtual reality. And we're getting pretty good at building 3D models. So if you're working in a consultant's practice, it's normal to operate in the 3D environment. Digital fabrication is crucial. It's a much better environment to work in. We find that our staff are much happier. They work in an enclosed environment with air conditioning, sometimes some definitely ventilation. They're not exposed to the weather elements. And they've got a much safer environment to operate in. So we want to do more prefabrication. We want to do more manufacturing. Digital construction. And we're looking at everything from RFID through to drones, through augmented reality, virtual reality. And then is asset delivery and management. If you listen to other presentations, if you listen to other speakers, there is a huge amount of money to be made in better management of our facilities. But unfortunately, people who design them never experience the operation of those facilities. So we design problems into buildings. We manufacture problems into buildings. And the people that are running them don't tell us what we have to fix going forward. So we need a better engagement between the actual building owners, operators, and the people who are designing and constructing those facilities. And the BCA have set out a very clear strategy. And they're very broad. So we have to develop capability. We have to come up with better collaborative procedures. We have to look at using platforms and common standards. Okay? What's great about the BCA's presentation is they also are cognizant of all the challenges. So that you can see under each of these domains are key challenges, not least of which are basically creating models in design phase which can be used for all the subsequent phases. Okay, so I've come from the design industry and working in the construction industry. There needs to be a better feedback loop. And the one slide I like, John, from your presentation was the one of the Greeks and the Roman Empire and the guys laying bricks. The one thing you'll notice in the Roman Empire was the architect and the owner were standing in that picture giving instructions. <laughs> Right? That's not happening in modern construction. So we need a much closer integration. And that's why I like what happened in Changi and we let what some of the work we're doing in, in Malaysia. We have co-located teams. The design team, the construction team are all operating in the same facility, in the same building, and sometimes in the same office space. It's crucial that we actually have all the players at the coal face working together. So very quickly, technology construction. You've seen this before. This is a virtual animation of a, of a project. This was done to demonstrate a design. Anybody who's been involved in construction in the last 10 years will have seen this kind of pretty picture. This is a demonstration of how BIM can be used for construction. This is a station we're building in Malaysia for the Line 2 MRT project. This is the architectural model. So these models just demonstrate how much detail we can do with design. This is design and build contractors. The contractors are actively involved in this process. So we've got diaphragm walling for the main station box. We've got seat compile walling for the temporary works, or for the temporary edits, permanent edits. And you can see steel structures, concrete structures. These stations are very, very complicated, like you have here with the LTA. 
This is the system inside the box. This is the air conditioning system, the life safety systems, the drainage systems. All of this has been designed in 3D, and it's all been coordinated with the actual railway operation. So we've actually got a full model of all the railway systems integrated into this process. So the first thing we do with these models is coordination. We make sure that all these things fit together, and we make sure that they're actually going to work when we actually get them on site. So there's a coordination, there's a buildability, buildability check. And then what we're doing then is we're taking those models and we're using slightly more advanced technology. This is a laser scan. So we've gone out to the existing site. So this new station has been built beside two existing stations. And we've scanned the entire environment down to five millimeter accuracy. And we've used that scan to create a reference model for the actual existing condition. So the design model for the future is completely coordinated with the existing conditions. So we can actually tie two things together, the virtual environment and the real environment. How many people here owns a drone? <laughs> Only one. Have you crashed into a tree yet? Never. Never. <laughs> We've been flying drones for the last 18 months. My son, my son is four, he thinks the drones are for flying into trees. That's what he thinks, because I've done it so often. My, my wife had to climb a tree to rescue my drone. So they're not for flying into trees. They're for surveying sites. Now, we've always been told a picture speaks a thousand words. Well, we're taking that to a whole new level. This is a sequence of pictures taken by a drone 100 meters off the ground. And you can see if anybody who's into photography, these are very high resolution pictures. The little yellow box is myself and my colleague, Nick Moorcock. We fly the drone. Now, we do this safely. So there's always two people. There's one operator for the drone, and there's one person watching the drone. So when you're flying with the technology, you have to watch your iPad. But when you've got a drone in a construction site, you want to make sure it doesn't wipe out a crane or a building or something else. So you have to have a, sp a spotter. Okay? We always keep the drones inside the site. And what we do is we take all those pictures, we put them in a computer. Well, we don't put them in the computer. We put the SD card in the computer. And we process the pictures into a 3D model. Okay? So this is a 3D photogrammic model. And it is very, very accurate. So we can actually measure the length of a pile wall on the construction site. Now, to put this in perspective, a traditional survey of this site would take a week with guys with boots on the ground, and it would take them another week to process the information. We can take the photographs in two hours, and we can create the model in two hours. So in a morning, we can create a 3D environment of the site. And what we're doing is we're actually taking that site, and we're bringing it back to the design office, and we're making sure that as we design the actual facility, we're taking into effect what's happening on the actual construction site. So in a design and build environment, the use of drones for very fast surveying can have an immediate effect on the design. This is another station, Chancel Lynn, same principles, 3D models of everything. But what I want to show you here is this is a traditional site series of photographs. What we're doing here is we're using GIS. Anybody here using GIS? Geographical Information Systems? This is an online platform. So we're able to take these models, put them online. So you can get to this through a web browser. So if you have the URL and you have Chrome or internet browser, you can get to this web page. And on this web page, you can see the design model, and you can also see the latest photogrammic model. So on a two-week cycle, we're actually pu publishing that information. It's a secure site, so it's not public, but it's published to all the project participants. And you can look at the current site condition, and you have a couple of boxes which allow you to turn on and off different things. So you can actually look at the current site, and you can actually then put in place the actual future construction, so you can see where the site is today compared to the design model. So in a second, the operator is going to turn on the model. So here you can see the future station actually supplanted into the actual photogrammic model. Now, this is really, really critical. In order to get collaboration between a design team and a construction team using technology, you have to make it this simple. It has to be on a browser, so anybody can use it on a mobile device. It has to be quick, and it has to be accessible. So we're not just doing the stations or the buildings. We're also doing all of the infrastructure around that. So we can do the shafts. We can do the ventilation buildings. But we're also doing the tunneling. So all of the tunnels have been modeled to great detail. So you can see here the segments. You can see the hangars. You can see the walkway. Uh, what's, what's interesting about this is that all of these systems are by other contractors. So in, to create this model, we had to collaborate between our own consultants and the MRT's contractors and gather all the information in order to build this model. It looks quite simple, but it took quite a while. Now, one of the other things we're very proud of at Gamuda is the ability to use these models for our construction planning and our quantity takeoffs. So what we've been doing is we've been taking the same models that designers are working on, and we've been bringing them into a tool which is called Costex, and it allows us to take quantities from those models. 
So we can take floor finish areas, wall areas, wall volumes, concrete volumes, and we can actually run up an entire schedule of the quantities. Now, this seems really, really interesting, but it becomes very, very powerful as design progresses. So you can compare one stage of design to the next stage of design. You can get a very quick estimate of a design based on these models in 60% design, and then you can compare it when you get to 90% design, and so on and so forth. But what we're looking at now is actually using these 5D models for actual progress on site, monitoring the progress on site, looking at the model, looking at the photogrammetry, doing a comparison of what's been built, what's left to be built, and it gives us the ability to do forward cash planning. So we're actually able to use the digital model aligned with the takeoffs and aligned with progress on site. And it gives us a very powerful monitoring tool. Now, all of this is possible if you have a very robust IT infrastructure behind it. And what we're doing on our projects is using a thing called a common data environment. And this is a phrase that comes from the UK. Essentially, it's a cloud-based collaboration platform. So all of our information is actually based on a cloud server. And all the information is distributed by the consultants onto this platform. And it has to go through a series of gates of approval. So it doesn't just get dumped into a folder like Dropbox. It gets submitted to the system. It goes through a workflow. And once it's being checked and approved, it gets shared with other people. So in our case, we've got information coming from Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, and China, all getting sent back to the head office. And it is of a very, very large scale. We've got 3,600 models. We've got something like 45,000, probably even more documents. So it's very important that doc that information is secure and controlled. So all the data that's on that you can see in the, in the list. Essentially, all the design information is shared on that platform. So we have to have secure information. We have to have access, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all this technology, but I would argue that that doesn't actually provide collaboration. I will be the first to tell you BIM does not equal collaboration. BIM is possible as a way forward. But unless you have a collaborative environment, you're not going to get the value from BIM. And I've been doing BIM since 2003, and I've yet to see a successful project. I've seen projects come close. I've seen huge value on projects. I've never seen one that's got a five-star rating. And when you look at the failures, what happened on site, what happened in the design office, it always boils back down to the former contract. And in a, in a design, tender, construct model, you actually undermine the potential value of collaboration. So it's very, very welcoming to hear that you guys are looking at, looking at NEC, looking at forms of collaboration. These are some of the comments I've heard from clients before. I wish BIM was used earlier. And I always say, well, that's fine, but did you actually use a collaborative form of contract? We used BIM, but the results weren't what we expected. Okay? That's very common. And then I say, well, what form of contract are you using? Because you think BIM is going to give you collaboration, and I say BIM will not give you collaboration unless you've got a form of contract that allows it. Now, ironically, I then say you have to make the deliverables contractual. So we operate in an environment where people always go back to the contract. So what I say is you need to make sure that the client is driving this from the first instance. So you can see here in the documents that you will only get collaboration with client involvement. And you can see the example from Changi. If the client steps back and basically thinks that the contract is going to drive collaboration, good luck. See you, see you at the other end. Okay? Any client who walks away and thinks that somebody else is going to sort it out for them, it's not going to happen. So when we work with clients, we're, we're very happy to work with the organizations like Changi, like MRT, like the LTA, who are very involved, very proactive. They're the ones who get the success. But we keep telling our clients, unless you're going to get involved, you're not going to get success. And you must have a clearly defined outcome. So under the UK standard, which is now becoming an ISO, there must be a clearly defined employer's information requirements. What models are required? What information is required from those models? When are those models going to be delivered? What can those models be used for? That all has to be laid out by the client at the beginning of the project, not by the engineer when he's writing the contract for the contractor. Too late, you're not going to win. Okay? It has to be led by the client. And none of this works without early contractor involvement. I am a huge believer in early contractor involvement. The people who know how to build these things are not the architects, they're not the engineers. They have ideas, they've got great designs, but the only people to know how to do digital fabrication, off-site manufacturing, on-time delivery, are the actual contractors. If you don't have a contractor involved early in your project, it's not gonna play out the way you think it's gonna play out. So if you have a design consultancy agreement, 
make sure that that includes very clearly written up requirements for contractual deliverables around BIM and make sure that takes into account how it's going to be used for quantification, for drawings, for schedules and quantities. So to wrap up, here's the problem. It's not just about the contracts. It's not just about the access to technology. We have a serious problem in our industry in that we don't train or develop enough people. We don't bring people up. We assume they have the skills, and we throw them in the deep end. I used to tell my friends when I started working in this industry, it was like being thrown into a swimming pool, and as you went in, they anchored you down with two concrete blocks and see, see how quickly you can swim to the surface. Okay? You, we need to improve how we train people. We're getting better at it. We have a training academy. We're putting people through the academy, but it needs to be done far more systematically across the industry. When you talk about BIM, everybody gets caught up in things like computers and software and servers and IT and all this great stuff. That's the technology which is 6% of the problem. We've done the research, we've done the numbers, it's all about the staff. Okay? BIM doesn't work unless you have people who know what they're doing. And we don't have enough people with the experience of these projects and we don't share enough lessons. So we have to improve how we train our staff, how we train our people. And I'm not just talking about our firm, I'm talking about the in industry as a whole. Okay? So it's very, very important. So on the project we're doing at the moment, we're not talking about putting them in the classroom and talking to them. Okay? We're talking about running workshops, classroom sessions, training experiences, moving them between different job roles, doing workshops, doing online sharing, getting people to make videos about what they're doing and sharing them with their colleagues, doing Q&A. Education and training is not just about getting people in the room for two days and train them how to use a piece of software. It's continual, it requires many different approaches, and we're looking at every one of those. So we list down all the things that we're looking at. So we're looking at project onboarding. When someone comes on board, what skills do they have, what skills do they need? On-the-job support, pairing people up, someone who's got experience, someone who doesn't have experience, buddying systems, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, using online systems. So we're now using Facebook, would you believe, in our company. We have an internal corporate Facebook, and on that system, we're sharing videos, clips, knowledge, so people that can't get to the classroom can see the information. So it's critical that we rethink how we train and develop our people. So I'm going to leave you with three thoughts. We all want to do things smarter, faster, better. There's no question that we want to do a better job. But our contracts prohibit that. And when Dr. Chung, John Kong says we need a behavioral mindset change, at the moment, our current contracts prevent that mindset change. The technology, the process, the experience, it's all there. We've all done it. We've done the, this hotel at the airport. We've done the, the Canopies project. We're doing the MRT. But the people that work on those projects don't go out and share what they've learned. There's no lessons learned. Those people just move on without sharing broader education. So we need to look at how we train people. And then the key point to this is that we've actually got to figure out how we get the same players to participate on multiple projects over many, many years. What we're doing as an industry, we build something once, and then we basically go off and create a different team to do the next project. If we really want to unlock collaboration and technology, we've got to start taking five, 10-year views. How do we create long-term partnerships, long-term collaborations, so we can actually share that knowledge? And it has to be shared somehow. So I know that's a really difficult one to do. But unless we can start doing multi-year, multi-term agreements, we're really not going to get to a collaborative form of contracting. And I'll leave you with my favorite catchphrase. Regardless of what we all discuss, regardless of what contracts we have, regardless of what technology we use, it will get built. The only question is, how many lawyers will it take to finish the agreements? <laughs> that's it for me. Thank you all very much.